I'm Jackie Murray, Associate Professor of Classics at the University of Kentucky. In this lecture that I have entitled Appointment with Destiny, Carthage's Fated Defeat in Virgil's Aeneid and Silius Italicus's Punica, I'll examine how Roman epic supported Rome's imperialist ideology. And this quote from Tassus Agricola has already been mentioned in this lecture series, but bears repeating here. The historian famously put a clear-eyed critique of Roman expansion in the mouth of Calgacus, the Caledonian chieftain, exhorting his people to resist Agricola's army. Theft, slaughter, rape, these the Romans call empire under a false name, and where they create desolation, they call it peace. The bite of this critique is, of course, blunted when Calgacus's forces are massacred. The implication is that the Caledonians brought their own destruction upon themselves. For when it comes to the Roman Empire, resistance was futile. Roman epic discourse staves off a critique of the atrocities entailed in Rome's imperialist expansion by likewise shifting the responsibility for the exploitation, enslavement, and genocide that necessarily happened onto the conquered peoples themselves. Through the magic of poesis, epic poets gave Rome's rise the sense that it was produced by the inexorable operations of fate, and that all efforts to obstruct Rome's path to its destiny of world domination, even when that obstruction consisted in a divine assisted self-defense, all of these were doomed not just to failure, but to a failure that could be interpreted as divine punishment. The tradition soon arose after the Punic Wars of representing Rome's rise as a sequel to the Trojan War. It goes back to the first Roman poets writing um, epic, Nivius and Ennius, who lived through the First and Second Punic Wars, respectively, both used the myth of Dido's encounter with Aeneas to tether Rome's recent defeats of Carthage causally to the aftermath of the fall of Troy. Subsequent Roman poets followed their example. Virgil and Silius are included. So in this lecture, I want to explore how Virgil and Silius, writing centuries after the Punic Wars, at times when Rome's destiny was proclaimed as a fait accompli, now how they then justified Rome's expansion to, by turning historical facts into fulfilled prophecy. So first, let's briefly go over the main events of the Punic Wars. This will help us understand why Romans thought their fate was tied up with the fate of Carthage and why the Punic War, the Second Punic War, the war with Hannibal, came to occupy such an important place in Roman epic that it equals the fall of Troy. So Roman Carthage went to war on three separate occasions between 264 and 146 BCE. The First Punic War, uh, 264 to 241, the second, 218 to 201, and the third was 149 to 146. Now the true underlying causes of the Punic Wars lay in the rivalry between Rome and Carthage for control over the Western Mediterranean. As this map of the Mediterranean before the outbreak of the Punic War reveals, Carthage and Rome had expanded their spheres of influence and control to the point where conflict between them was inevitable. Both empires could see the benefit of controlling the straits and islands around Sicily. Controlling these waters meant control over all east-west trade in the Mediterranean. And before the first clash, Carthage dominated the sea and the islands. In addition, Sicily itself had several wealthy Greek cities which could be exploited for economic benefit. Another important factor pushing Rome into war with Carthage was Roman expansionist ideology that connected the highly prized Roman virtue dignitas to military achievement. 
And since being credited with increasing the boundaries of the empire increased one's dignitas immensely, many ambitious aristocrats were necessarily war hawks, and they looked for any opportunity to gain a chance at military glory. And by the outbreak of the First Punic War, the entire peninsula had been conquered and incorporated into the Roman state, giving the Romans an, an almost unending supply of military manpower, but also nowhere to go, nowhere to expand, except into Carthage's sphere of influence. The First Punic War was not just the longest of the three major classes, clashes between Rome and Carthage, but lasting 23 years, it was one of the longest wars in ancient Roman history. The immediate causes were the actions of a band of mercenaries from Campania in Italy, known as Mamertines. Now, they had been hired by Hero, the Greek ruler of Syracuse, the wealthiest and most powerful city in Sicily, to help him capture Messana. But during a political shakeup that soon followed in Syracuse that weakened Hero's power, the Mamertines took advantage and broke away and seized control of Messana for themselves murdering many of the inhabitants, and then they started raiding the Syracusan territory. The Syracusans responded, and when it looked like the Mamertines would get defeated, they then appealed to Carthage to send military assistance. And of course, eager to expand their influence in Sicily, the Carthaginians sent a small force to occupy a fortress in Messana. And here's the rub. The Mamertines also sent the same appeal to Rome at the same time. But the Romans were a bit slower to respond. And so in 264, the councils, who saw the opportunity for military glory and expansion in, into Sicily, persuaded the Roman people to vote for the expedition. Now, the arrival of the Romans caused the Carthaginians now to switch alliances to align themselves with Hero against the Mamertines and the Romans in Messana. And it was not long after that that all that war broke out. When the Romans besieged Syracuse, Hero capitulated, abandoning his alliance with the Carthaginians and then signing a treaty with Rome. And now the struggle was between Rome and Carthage. The fighting remained inconclusive until the Romans decided to send troops to Africa itself. Marcus Attilius Regulus landed in Africa, but was captured and killed just as he was about to force Carthage to capitulate. More inconclusive battles then followed until Publius Claudius Pulcher was defeated at Drepana in 249, and Ham Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barca, assumed command of the Carthaginian forces in Sicily. And he then waged a successful guerrilla campaign against Rome for some time. Now the final engagement was the Battle of the Aigates Islands in 241, where Hamilcar was defeated and then forced to make a peace treaty. The terms of the treaty laid the seeds for the next conflict. Carthage was forced to cede control over Sicily and pay a massive indemnity. Rome later seized Corsica and Sardinia when an uprising of Carthaginian mercenaries who hadn't been paid took place in the aftermath of the war. And Rome imposed yet another additional indemnity because of the defeat. And as its first overseas territory, the Romans made the island of Sicily its first province, placing it under the direct control of a Roman governor. The Sicilians were not to become citizens or supply troops, which had been the policy the Romans had towards the cities they had conquered in Italy. Instead, the primary obligation of the Sicilians would be to pay annual taxes, establishing the way Rome would deal with territory annexed following future conquests. That is, to make them pay taxes and put them under the command of a Roman governor. So Rome was clearly the winner of the First Punic War, but Carthage was far from vanquished. It was still Rome's main rival in the Mediterranean. Carthage still possessed all of its African territories, 
as well as its outposts in Spain and other islands. Carthaginian interests in Spain grew between the First and Second Punic Wars. Hamilcar returned to Carthage briefly before taking a force to Spain, ostensibly to reestablish Carthaginian control over the Iberian Peninsula, but ultimately in order to extend Carthage's empire and challenge Rome's hegemony in the region. During the two decades between the wars, Carthaginian expansion was moving northwest, while the Romans, after they defeated the Gauls and added the Po Valley of Northern Italy to their possessions, they were expanding northwest. So another clash was definitely on the horizon, and in 226 BC, presumably to delay the inevitable, Rome and Carthage signed a treaty that set the river Ebro in Iberia as the boundary between the two powers. Carthage wasn't to expand north of the Ebro as long as Rome likewise didn't expand south of the river. A legend has it that before leaving Carthage for Spain, Hamilcar asked his nine-year-old son Hannibal to come along with him and when Hannibal said yes, he made his son swear a solemn oath of eternal hatred against Rome. Now, the war breaks out in 219 BCE, and scholars debate about who is the aggressor, but um, what seems to be clear is, on the one hand, Hannibal had held his father's command in Spain since 229, when Hamilcar died, and at some point, Saguntum and Rome had entered into a agreement that Rome treated as some kind of friendship status. So when Saguntum began raiding some nearby areas which were under Hannibal's control, and when Hannibal besieged Saguntum in response, Rome came to aid its friend. Now, from the Carthaginian perspective, Rome coming to aid its friend probably seemed like meddling in affairs within their zone of influence and even a violation of the Ebro Treaty. A good measure of blame could also be put on Rome and Saguntum for entering into what looks like a provocative relationship. And, of course, Saguntum can be blamed for raiding Carthaginian territory. Rome was clearly more powerful by the beginning of the Second Punic War. They had vast manpower reserves, and they could field an army that was many times larger than Carthage could. At sea, Carthage was no longer the superior power. Since the First Punic War, Rome had been developing a massive fleet. So Hannibal realized that Carthage would be at a disadvantage if the conflict was going to be waged outside of Italy. So his plan was to win decisive victories in Italy. This way he could get the Italians who wanted their freedom to revolt against Rome and side with him. But how would he get his army to Italy? The strength of the Roman fleet prevented a sea crossing. This left only marching from Spain over the Alps into Italy as his only option. And so early in May of 218 BCE, Hannibal set out with an army of 40,000 men and 37 elephants. But the snows, the avalanches, and the murderous hill tribes took such a toll on his forces that when he finally arrived in other Italy, he only had 26,000 men and one elephant. Nevertheless, his intrepid strategy so shocked and alarmed the Romans 
that the Senate quickly sent out both consuls against him with an army of 40,000 men. As a military genius, few generals in history are comparable to Hannibal. Once over the Alps, with just a remnant of his original army, Hannibal defeated the Romans in three major battles in quick succession. Tacinius River, the Trebia River, and Lake Trasimene. These defeats panicked the Roman Senate, who appointed Quintus Fabius Maximus as dictator to address the emergency. Fabius famously adopted a policy that earned him the name Cunctator, the delayer. In order to impede Hannibal's progress, he avoided him in open combat. Hannibal eventually forced the Romans into battle at Cannae in 216. There, he and his army massacred 65,000 Romans in one afternoon. The defeat was so massive and so terrifying that the Romans started to see Hannibal as an invincible enemy and reverted back to Fabius's cunctator strategy. So on the one hand, Hannibal had successfully invaded Italy and decisively beaten the Romans repeatedly on their own land. But on the other hand, his grand strategy was proving to be a failure. He had marched to the gates of Rome, but the Romans barricaded themselves inside and refuted, refused to fight or surrender. Meanwhile, he had to abandon his siege of the city because he didn't have enough siege equipment and his men needed food. Moreover, only a few Italian cities revolted against Rome and came over to his side. And these tended to be the newly acquired cities who were recently conquered. The vast majority of Italian cities remained loyal to Rome. So for the next 12 years, Hannibal roamed up and down Italy. Meanwhile, the Romans followed him around, sticking to Fabius's don't fight Hannibal strategy. But since the Romans were not afraid of other Carthaginian generals, they raised new armies and sent them out to fight in Italy, Spain, and ultimately in Africa. So in 210, Publius Cornelius Scipio, soon to be Africanus, assumed command of the Roman forces in Spain. He captured Carthago Nova and had decisive victories in Baikula and Ilipa. Meanwhile, in Italy, Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal was defeated at Metaurus River. In 204, Scipio invaded Africa, forcing Hannibal to return to defend the city. The Battle of Zama that took place outside of Carthage in 201, which was supposed to be the showdown between the two generals, was pretty much a straightforward Roman victory. After 12 years of dealing with Hannibal, the Romans started to understand his strategy. They knew how to neutralize his most devastating tactics, including how to deal with the Carthaginian war, war elephants. Scipio's troops were also just better. They're no more numerous, they're more enthusiastic than Hannibal's discouraged and aged veterans. So Hannibal was ultimately defeated in Africa and Carthage had to surrender. The terms of the peace were designed to make it impossible for Carthage to pose a threat to Rome ever again. Carthage had to pay a crushing indemnity of 10,000 talents for the next 50 years. Carthage had to give up its territory to Rome, except for the city itself. It was allowed to maintain a small army and a token fleet of no more than 10 ships. And as to Hannibal, well, the great Carthaginian general became a war-weary, disillusioned politician in Carthage. He tried to reform the corrupt Carthaginian government, and this went unappreciated, especially by those elites who were benefiting from the corruption. And they, in turn, spread rumors about Hannibal in Rome, claiming that he was plotting to take war back to Rome again. The Romans then sent men to arrest him, Hannibal fled Carthage 
and the Romans continued to hound him. And finally, in 183 BCE, they closed in on him in Bithynia, where he drank poison and committed suicide. It's become almost proverbial to say that Rome's very survival as a city-state, let alone its nation empire, hinged upon the outcome of its wars with Carthage, especially the war, the Second Punic War against Hannibal. The expansion of both empires put them on a collision course where only one could survive, and without a doubt, the defeat of Carthage made Rome the master of the Mediterranean. Like matter and antimatter, Rome or Carthage had to be destroyed. The Greek historian Polybius, whose histories covered the entire period of the Punic Wars, began his work asking a rhetorical question that still concerns us today. Can anyone be so indifferent or idle as not to care to know by what means and under what kind of polity almost the whole entire inhabited world was conquered and brought under the dominion of a single city, Rome, and within a period of not quite 53 years, too? Or who, again, can be so completely absorbed in other subjects of contemplation or study as to think any of them more important than gaining an accurate understanding of an event for which the, the past present had no precedent. So the sudden appearance of the Roman Empire as a new political and cultural phenomenon demanded and still demands explanation. In offering these explanations, Roman historians concerned themselves with the likely concatenation of events that produced the present order. Hence Polybius is framing of the question by focusing on what means or under what kind of polity. For the historian, Rome and Carthage's mutually exclusive drive to conquer all lands and territories needs no explanation. The reasonableness of expansion was taken for granted and assumed a sufficient explanation for why Rome and Carthage had to come into conflict. Why Rome and not Carthage emerged victorious had to be credited to some other kind of expl explanation. Moral superiority was chosen. So it's the political institutions that explain why Rome emerged as master of the world. But the rational explanations of historians can only go so far as a justification for the monstrosity of oppression and exploitation that the Roman Empire was for most of its subjects. Enter the poets. Being unconstrained by the dictates of rational discourse, epic poets were free to represent the divine levers of fate as causes of Rome's rise and Carthage's defeat. Beginning with Rome's earliest epic poets, the prodigious rise of Rome's empire was causally linked to the intentions and actions of the gods interfering in the human world and the intentions and actions of the human beings of consequence, Aeneas and Dido, that happened in the distant past at a great remove from the ken of history. Virgil's Aeneid tells the wanderings of the Trojan hero Aeneas, the son of Venus, whose destiny is to found a new Troy in Italy, Rome. Thus, epic causality locates the beginning of Rome's rise in the immediate aftermath of the Trojan War. Similarly, Silius Italicus's Punica, which tells the events of the Second Punic War, connects these historical events to the actions and intentions of the gods and heroes in the Aeneid. Juno's anger, Aeneas's betrayal of Dido, and Dido's curse are all part of an unbroken causal chain of events that led to Hannibal's war against Rome. In Virgil's Aeneid, Rome's rise to world dominance is decreed by fate. Venus, seeing that Juno has been keeping Aeneas from reaching Italy and has used a storm to drive him to Carthage, confronts Jupiter with his promise to her that the descendants of the Trojans will one day rule the world. 
Now, Jupiter responds with a prophecy that traces the history of Rome from Aeneas' arrival to Italy to Augustus's Pax Romana. According to Jupiter, it is through brutal military conquest that Rome will attain her fated position as Caput Mundi. He says, I've granted them power, empire without end. Even furious Juno, now plaguing the land and sea and sky with terror, she will mend her ways and hold dear with me these Romans, lords of the earth, the race arrayed in togas. This is my pleasure, my decree. Indeed, an age will come as the long years slip by when Assaracus's royal house will quell Achilles' homeland, brilliant Mycenae too, and enslave their people, rule defeated Argos. Rome's brutal conquest of Greece that happened around the time of the Punic Wars here resists critique because the enslavement of the inhabitants of Argos, Mycenae, and Thessaly is presented as a divine prophecy and framed as just revenge against the Greeks for sacking Troy. The discourse of fate and prophecy make the atrocities that accompany Rome expansion into Greece seem not only inevitable, but also justified. Now, since the historical inhabitants of Argos, Mycenae, and Thessaly constructed their ethnic identities as descendants of the mythical heroes who destroyed Troy, they can fairly be made to bear the collective punishment of their ancestors. However, in the case of Rome's brutal annihilation of historical Carthage in the Punic Wars, more poetic work was needed to construct a justification. Accordingly, with allusions to the earlier attempts by Nivius and Ennius, Virgil puts Carthage and Rome on their destined collision course by locating the original defense in the mythical aftermath of the Trojan War. At that time, Carthage and its people were the favorites of Juno, who was ignorant of the decrees of fate and who still harbored an implacable hatred for the Trojans and their descendants, the true Romans. Here she kept her armor, here her chariot too, and Carthage would rule the nations of the earth if only the fates were willing. This was Juno's goal from the start, and so she nursed her city's strength. But she heard a race of men sprung of Trojan blood would one day topple down her Tyrian stronghold. Breed an arrogant people, pulling, far, ruling far and wide, proud in battle, destined to plunder Libya. So the fates were spinning out the future. This was Juno's fear. So Virgil calls Juno Saturnia, marking the goddess's status as an opponent of the world order that Jupiter is establishing. It is as Saturn's daughter, not Jupiter's wife, that she's been preventing Aeneas from reaching Italy when we open the poem and causing them to wander around the world year in and year out. The epithet recalls the divine wars of succession between Saturn and the Titans on the one hand and Jupiter and the Olympians on the other. So Juno's opposition to Rome and her support for Carthage at the beginning of the poem this can be interpreted as a continuation of the earlier divine succession struggles. In Book 4, when Juno realizes that she can't thwart Aeneas's destiny, she tries to make Carthage the city that he ends up founding. When she sees that Venus has caused Dido to fall in love with Aeneas, she encourages her to incite them to make their marriage relationship intimate while she herself sanctions it as a marriage. Now her hope is that the love bond between them will prevent the prophecy that Rome will topple down her Tyrian stronghold from being fulfilled. 
But then Jupiter sends Mercury to tell Aeneas to leave Carthage and return to his mission of founding Rome in Italy. Dido is left heartbroken, and in her anger she curses Aeneas and his descendants. That is my curse, my final cry. I pour it out with my lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, harry with hatred all his line, his race to come. Make the offering to my ashes, send it down. No love between our people, ever, no pacts of peace. Come, rising up from my bones, you avenger, still unknown, to stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash, shore, sea against sea, sword against sword, this is my curse. War between all our peoples, all their children, endless war. So after her curse, Dido climbs onto her pyre and says her last words against Aeneas. Let the cruel Trojans' eyes drink in this fire on the deep and bear with him the evil omen of my death. She then stabs herself with a sword. Virgil traces the direct line between her death and the fall of Carthage through similes comparing the lamentation for her with the fall of the city's Carthage or Tyre. A cry arose to the high ceiling. Rumor run riot struck the city. The houses sounded with weeping and sighs and women's cries. The sky echoed with a mighty lamentation as if all Carthage or ancient Tyre were falling to an invading enemy and raging flames were rolling over the roofs of men and gods. We tend to focus on Dido's call for an avenger, that is Hannibal, and overlook the more general implications of her prayer. She's calling for the Carthaginians to be constantly at war with Rome. They are to make no alliances, personal or political. They're to perpetuate her hatred, and they are to be the aggressors, constantly harrying Aeneas' descendants. Her curse thus shifts the blame for all the Punic Wars on to the Carthaginians, and their actions are here represented as motivated by a filial duty to avenge their first queen. Hannibal's invasion of Italy is predicted again at the beginning of Aeneid 10, when Jupiter rebukes the gods for interfering in the war with Aeneas and Turnus. The right time for fighting will come. Don't bring it on. They, when fierce Carthage piercing the Alps will launch great destruction on the Roman strongholds, then it will be fine to compete in hatred and ravage things. So here Jupiter points out that there is room within what fate has decreed for Juno to fulfill Dido's curse and to satisfy her own anger against the Trojans. But the time to vent that divine wrath is not now. That time will come when Hannibal invades Italy. So just as in Homer's Iliad, where the anger of Achilles gets its destructive power when Zeus grants his support to his mother Thetis, there are limits. Achilles does not have the right to desecrate Hector's body indefinitely. So in the Aeneid, Dido's curse is limited in time. It cannot obtain its judo back efficacy at this moment, but it has to wait for the moment to come in the Second Punic War. Now, when we turn to Silius's Punica, we can see that the Flavian poet takes up the story of Rome's conflict with Carthage precisely where Virgil left it. Juno's hostility to Rome's rise and Dido's curse against Aeneas and his descendants are central motivating factors for Carthage's wars against Rome. One can't help but notice 
however, that at the end of the Aeneid, Juno had accepted Rome's destiny to rule the world, but at the beginning of the Punica, she seems to be very angry and still acting against Rome. But then Juno saw great Rome lift its head higher than other cities and even send its ships across the seas to bring the victorious Roman battle standards through the world. Juno feared encroaching danger and goaded the Carthaginians' hearts with madness for war. But the first war crushed their attempt, and the Sicilian waters shattered their undertaking. And yet Juno took up renewed arms and tried once more. One leader, Hannibal, provided for her as she troubled the earth and prepared to roll the sea. But Silas's Juno is not really repudiating her decision in the Aeneid to accept Rome's rise. Rather, in stimulating the Carthaginians to war against Rome, she's been fulfilling Dido's curse and venting her anger within the framework prescribed by fate. In the Aeneid, Jupiter said that the right time would come, and in the Punica, the right time has come. Silas's Juno can tolerate Rome's fated status as Caput Mundi so long as Hannibal has his devastating victories, so long as the banks of the river Ticinus shall not have room for Roman corpses, the river Trebia shall flow backward through the Celtic countryside, blocked by men's weapons and bodies, it shall become a river Simois from Trojan blood for me, Lake Trasimene shall shrink back in fear at its own pools, disturbed from great carnage. So long as I shall look down on high at the battlefield of Cannae, Italy's grave, and the Apagian fields drowning with Roman blood, River Aufidus, doubtful of its course, its banks drawn together, shall hardly be able to break its way through the Adriatic shores as it passes through men's shields and helmets slashed and slashed limbs. Silius put Juno's angry intentions and Dido's curse in tension with the human actors and how they understand the fulfillment of fate that will take place. In the temple of Dido, built on the supposed site of her suicide, Hamilcar has Hannibal make an oath, which he begins with a complaint about injustice of Rome's expansion. So gently touching his son's head, the father gives him a kiss and rouses his passions through encouragement and fills his spirit with the following words. The Trojans' reborn race is oppressing Cadmus's Carthaginian descendants with an unfair treaty. If the fates have denied me the chance to remove this disgrace from our country with my own hand, then may you, my son, wish this upon your own glory. Come on now, plan a war that will bring destruction to the Romans. Let Tuscany's young men already fear your origins. And as you grow, let Latin mothers refuse to bring forth their children. Hannibal repeated his father's words, adding his own. When I'm old enough, I'll pursue the Romans on land and sea, and I'll repeat the fate of Troy. The gods shall not block me, nor the treaty that holds back war, nor the high Alps, nor the Tarpeian rock. I swear to this intention by the divinity of my our god Mars and by our, your ghost, Queen Dido. Hannibal's ultimate intention to destroy Rome cannot be fulfilled because it goes beyond what fate has decreed for Rome and Carthage, that is, beyond what has actually happened in history. The sight of Hannibal's oath contributes to its lack of efficacy. The temple is not located where Dido actually killed herself. It's only where they say she committed suicide. And so the place doesn't have the necessary numinous power to back up his oath. 
In Punica II, during Hannibal's siege of Saguntum, his Spanish allies give him a decorated shield. And this shield is a mortal creation and depicts scenes of only the past and the present, right up to the present moment, in fact. On the right side, uh, it focuses on Dido and the Barkids, that is Hannibal's ancestors. On the left side, it has scenes from Carthaginian history and pastoral life. And in the center, it shows the Battle of Saguntum that's actually happening. And the rim depicts the crossing of the Ebro about to happen. So the extent of the future that the shield can depict is extremely limited only to what appears to be about to happen. Now the first images retell Dido's story in the Aeneid, but from a tendentious pro-Carthaginian perspective. And we see the founding of Carthage, Aeneas' shipwreck, and the reception by Dido, the consummation of their love in the cave, Aeneas' departure, and Dido's death on the pyre. Basically, book four, one, one and four of the Aeneid. Now the depiction of Dido and Aeneas that is retold here on the shield emphasizes Dido's hospitality and Aeneas's ingratitude. Dido's charge to her future descendants to fight Aeneas and her call for an avenger is also depicted and it's answered on the shield by a scene where Hannibal is swearing his oath against Rome in Dido's temple. Hamilcar also appears next on the shield he is depicted as a great warrior in the First Punic War. So all of this fulfilling Dido's more general call for the perpetual war with Rome. Thus, in Silius's epic, Roman history is presented as originating from the events that happened in the aftermath of Troy, specifically those prophetic utterances in the Aeneid. Dido's curse leads to the wars between Carthage and Rome and Hannibal's devastating in invasion of Italy. Even the Battle of Zama at the end of the Punica looks back to the beginning of the Aeneid where Juno has heard the descendants of heard that the descendants of the Trojans will someday topple down her Tyrian stronghold. However, although Silius's Juno can't thwart fate, and she seems to have accepted it. In the epic, she can, however, interfere with history. Just as Venus did in the Iliad, which rescued Aeneas from the battlefield, Juno rescues Hannibal by diverting him from the Battle of Zama, and she turns him into a spectator of his own defeat instead of a participant. So both Virgil and Silius make the Punic Wars faded and inevitable events springing from Dido's curse, which means that Roman imperial expansion then is shielded from critique because the Carthaginians, in answering their queen's curse, are always forever the aggressors, and so they get what is coming to them. Thank you for listening.